I need someone to hold me down, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. While I'm out getting my crown, yeah. I can be yours if you let me. If you promise not to let go. Be the one you want, baby, let's go. Me and you against the world. I wanna be in. I wanna be in. I wanna be inside, girl, let me in. Come along with me, leave your past behind. World is yours if you swear you're mine. So the weight on my shoulder blaze is gone. All I back is nowhere inside. If you roll with me, I will bet it all. Don't believe me, roll up paradise. I'ma hold you down till we're old and green. Reach the golden gates of paradise. That means I got you for life, Bonnie and Clyde. If you along for the ride, we can take on civilization as we know it. Nobody can stop you and I. Move as a unit, a team. With you as my queen, check me these pawns switching sides. Menace to modern society. Because for you, I will shoot anybody on sight, girl. Got me feeling invincible. So you leave and I start missing you. Look at the trials that we've been through. Your heartbeat still matches my tempo. Can nothing come between me and you? The opposite will never against you. We gon' take on our enemies. Long as you're riding with me. I can be yours if you let me. All right, hi everyone, um, welcome. My name is Shilevi Shripati and welcome to this uh, conversation. Uh, I wanna first thank the Philadelphia Asian American Film Festival for creating the space and especially Selena, um, her first year as a festival director, totally doing it right. Um, uh, I currently am at WHYY, I am the, which is the PBS station here in Philadelphia. Um, I am the Director of Programming and Production, and I'm really, really excited to be joined with these guests. But the first thing I want to do is do a land acknowledgement. I am here in Philadelphia, as I mentioned, which is the land of the Lene Lenape people. Um, my pronouns are she and hers. I am an Indian woman with dark brown skin, black hair. I am wearing a dark sweater and in a room with a vibrant green background. Um, and I'd like uh, our guests to go ahead and introduce themselves and then we're gonna jump right into it. So whoever wants to jump in, take the lead. <laughs> Everyone's trying to be so polite. <laughs> I'll, I'll start, uh, my name is Bowen. Um, I use he, him pronouns. Um, I am in the occupied territory of the Mohican people part of the Haudenosaunee uh, Confederacy um, in upstate uh, New York. And I am a South Asian male wearing a black sweatshirt. I have facial hair and I just got a haircut, which is kind of exciting. Um, so that hasn't happened in a long time. Um, and that's it. Is that it? Anything else? That's great. Okay. I can go. Um... My name, is, my name is Rahi Hassan. I use they, them pronouns. Um, I'd like to do a land acknowledgement for the state I'm in, and this was provided to me um, by the beautiful Courtney Reed Eaton, who is my colleague and friend from the Center for Documentary Studies where I work. Um, I acknowledge the Kohari, Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians, um, Hollywood Saponi, Lumbee, Meharin, Okanichi Band of Saponi, Saponi and Waccamaw Sioux peoples whose lands include what is known today as North Carolina. I recognize those peoples for whom these were ancestral lands as well as the many indigenous people who live and work in the region today. I acknowledge the humanity, inherent value and labor of enslaved Africans brought to this country and that their descendants and the immigrants and migrants who have and continue to contribute to the life and prosperity of American communities I am a South Asian femme presenting um, non-binary person. Um, I have a striped blue and white um, uh, top on, and I have black, dark, curly hair on one side, the other side is shaved. My uh, room has three maps, one of a uh, world map, United States map, and a map, map of Bangladesh. Thank you. Hi everyone, um, my name is Emily Holm and my pronouns are she, hers. I'm a filmmaker and um, visual anthropologist. Um, I also teach at Haverford College. Um, so I usually am 
in in uh, Philadelphia, um, otherwise known as stolen Lenape land. Um, at the moment, however, I'm currently in Thailand. Um, right now, um, where I am, you'll see a, a bright um, red background with a painting and what I'll reveal as a fake green tree <laughs> next to me. Um, I'm wearing a black shirt. I have dark hair um, and dangly earrings. Um, and I am a multiracial Asian American woman. Great, thank you so much, everyone. So, so we're all here to have a conversation about uh, decolonizing documentaries and, and uh, the, hopefully everyone has read and you're here, you read the description. And we wanted to start off with kind of just grounding what the, how we're entering this conversation. The first line in the description um, is, is documentary film a colonial construct? So yes, it is. And then we're gonna move on from there. <laughs> That's pretty much how we're entering the conversation. So I'd like to open it up to everybody to maybe spend a couple of minutes just talking about what aspects of decolonization you were kind of looking at and or focused on. Um, and then what we're gonna do after we just kind of establish kind of what that is, we really wanna move in to talking about what are structures, what are value systems, what are approaches and ways that we, you are all working with in your organizations, within your own programming choices and how we collectively can work and support um, around those value systems. So I'm gonna start with Rahi. Yeah, um, I think uh, I wanna share a kind of an analogy that uh, brought me into um, like my own learning around um, decolonial practices um, in documentary filmmaking and um, what like led me to um, for my practice to be impact centered. Um, so I, gener I initially came into documentary filmmaking from like my passion for social justice and um, one of the things that was very like, I was very neg negatively affected by in my life was um, people gossiping about me and like kind of talking behind my back um, and almost like fabricating uh, my identity or like my story, basically telling false stories about me. And um, what that, and it, it happened in various iterations in real life, on social media, on the internet, and I'm not gonna go dig into like why the cause of that, right? Like it could have been from people's, in, their own insecurities could have been from unhealed traumas and such, right? Um, and I think obviously my initial feelings were like hurt, vulnerable, powerless, um, and um, you know, just kind of realizing that I can't quite stop um, false narratives about me because it's happening because of people's own baggage or whatever, right? So what basically like as I was neg navigating those feelings in my personal um, experiences in my personal that caused me a lot of unrepairable traumas and harm that was caused to me, right? Um, it led me to documentary storytelling and I just really saw the power in telling my own story, right? And how that can, um, that in itself can overpower the false stories that have been told um, about me, right? And so I kind of see this like strong parallel of this personal experience in the practices that happens in extractive storytelling, right? So in my personal experience scenario, um, there's a storyteller who's kind of creating these false stories about me and t telling that, right? There is, um, uh, a subject. So I feel like I, I am a subject and not a participant because I wasn't participating in telling my story, right? And there is an audience um, who is listening to it who was, I don't know if they were critically listening to that story, right? Asking questions like, okay, so um, what is your source of information, right? Um, where is, uh, how much, how well do you know Rahi, 
right? Um, how, how, when's the last time you had a deep conversation with Rahi to, um, or like have built, or what is your relationship with Rahi to um, kind of tell me this story about Rahi, right? And so carrying that, that's like, that's, I'm carrying that, that's my trauma, that's my harm, that was caused to me, right? And so I bring that into analyzing uh, my practice, my art practice of storytelling, right? And so, um, and I will go into that later when we talk about more like reconstructing documentary, um, how in the formation of Undocumented Filmmakers Collective happened because there are a lot of false narratives that are being told about our communities that is harming our community, right? And causing that damage that's kind of unrepairable because that story is told. So. In that, so in that iteration, um, we we are create we are um, in the in a, in a um, created a platform where we're telling stories by us for us, right? So um, yeah, and 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 just there, I feel like there is I, I can kind of deconstruct and unpack that a lot in in that parallel comparison that kind of. Um, sort of like when I'm grounding myself in my practice, um, why I'm telling the story I'm telling, like I'm asking myself, am I causing harm, right? So in, um, just to go a little bit deeper into that, so in in my personal experience, um, when let's say that, um, like what would be, what would that person who's telling false stories about me, what would they need to unlearn um, to kind of change that practice, right? Which it could be an entitlement feeling that I can I can do this, so I'm doing it, right? Um, one of the one of the ways could be radical consent practice, right? Coming to me, asking me, hey, this is what I think your story is. Is this your story, right? Um, I want to share your story to these people. Can I do that, right? And so. Um, I think these are and, and again, like I'm I'm sharing this to like folks who are ready to unlearn at the moment, right? Um, and I think this practices like because that practice was causing me harm, and in the documentary field, I am seeing how colonial practices um, in extractive storytelling is causing harm. So that led me to spend a lot of time to deeply think about it and you know, and, and come to the practice that I'm, I'm, I'm still learning because, um, yeah, there's a lot to unlearn to learn. Yeah, thank you for that. Emily, I saw you nodding quite a lot. <laughs> I was wondering if there's anything that you wanted to bring in that uh, resonated with you with, with what Ahi was saying. I mean, so much, I think, I think, um, well, it's interesting that you called it radical consent because actually this question of, is this your story and can I share this with other people should not be a radical mm -hmm. notion, right? That should be so basic. But in reality that often it does happen that sometimes people do go to a film festival and they see someone they know who had no idea, right? That they were you know, that they were gonna be in this film. So that does definitely happen. Um, I, I guess, you know, I appreciated that Rahi brought to the table um, uh, their own experience and, and sort of how that shapes um, the way they look at decolonization. I think for me personally, um, the way that I look at it is definitely shaped by my own lived experience as someone who um, whose ancestors come from both sides of the colonial equation, I think number one, and also as someone who um, is an anthropologist and as a filmmaker, both trades that are have exceptionally colonial histories and intertwined histories, right? The first documentary is, you know, is also considered an ethnographic or anthropological film. Um, and then also my own background as an activist, you know, I've been organizing since I was 15. So how, how that also shapes my thinking. And I think, um, you know, one example that I, I'd like to bring one example to the table that I think shows what a decolonizing lens can offer um, in ways that, you know, for me get at two critical things. Um, you know, one is this 
the importance of um, internalized colonialism and how critical that is. I think this speaks to what Rahi said about the unlearning we have to do because each of us have, you know, have basically, you know, what is what is education if not lies basically that we have, you know, I say this as someone who teaches in college, but basically this, there's so much work that we have to unlearn and really learn the true histories of our ancestors, of our people and of other peoples that we should be in solidarity with. Um, so, and then on the other hand, I think decolonizing also can give us this lens, this analysis of power, right? In ways that if we just use the lens of diversity and inclusion, you know, that I see, I generally, I think it's quite apolitical, right? That what does that offer? Um, and, and I've been thinking about, I mean, this is not a documentary, but I know that, you know, our audience members will, will be familiar with, um, earlier this summer, uh, people, you know, a lot of Asian Americans were excited about Mulan, right? Mulan was supposed to be this moment, right? That, you know, young Asian women could see themselves somehow, right? And I think as, as a community, you know, as diverse as we are, we're so thirsty for that representation because we've, you know, we're, we have, we didn't grow up seeing ourselves, right? On screen. And so I think there is that, but at the end of the day, um, for me, Mulan was this critical moment of reckoning, I think, for, for the Asian American film community, especially the documentary community, which is, are we going to align ourselves with this film when in fact, yes, there were Asian, Ameri there were Asian actors on screen, but behind the scenes, there were zero Asian directors, producers, screenwriters, and probably the most significant credit of that film was local Chinese government actually who were thanked in the credits because they shot the film um, in a place where the Uyghur minority community has been um, put in concentration camps of you know up to a million people. So I think for me, that example really shows, are we willing to um, have this kind of superficial representation, quote unquote, when in fact, right, if you bring a decolonizing lens to it, um, you know, first of all, like, I think we need to also be critical of the fact that that film and also the Asian Americans who did support that film, right, including Gold House, right, of what is, where does the state and where does capital come into it, right? There's, with every film, I think there is you know, we need to have this analysis and the colonial and uh, decolonial analysis will bring into the ways that state and capital are implicated because that's the logic of colonialism, right? Is, is this kind of form of extraction, whether it is, you know, settler colonialism or more classical forms of colonialism. So I think again, like, you know, Asian Americans, we are thirsty for representation, but we need to kind of, I think importantly bring this lens in terms of analysis of power and um, really reflect on the ways that we've internalized some of these um, ways of thinking. Yeah, thank you. Bowen, let's bring you into the conversation and see kind of what's dropped in for you from Rahi and from Emily and your own thoughts. Yeah, I mean, so much you guys um, covered a lot. And I think that, you know, the one thing I just always think about is, is how, you know, visual imagery and, 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 you know, film and documentary has been weaponized um, and has been used as a tool, you know, of the colonial project, because I think the unfortunate reality is that no matter how much we try in some ways to really kind of think about different ways of, of, of sort of like diverting away from that model, we, in some ways we're still stuck in it, right? Because I do think that there's a part of even the terminology around decolonization that has to accept the fact that true decolonization is really about returning land and sort of, you know, um, it, it's a sort of a it's, a, it's a circle that that has to sort of come to some kind of, you know, uh, return and that is not gonna happen, right? The reality is that's not gonna happen in the construct that we're in now, but we can be aspirational. And one of the things that I'm really passionate about, I, 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 I mentor, I teach, um, I'm an educator as well as a filmmaker, um, you know, and I'm the direct co-director of an of a, of a organization called YouthFX and runs a, a fellowship called NextDoc, which is also, you know, sort of turning into a little bit more of a collective structure. And I think one of the things that 
I think a lot about is I think about how we can dismantle some of the structures that perpetuate and uplift um, these modes of production, these modes of storytelling that are, as Rahi mentioned, are, are actually causing harm to communities. And I think that's the the sort of deeper level of the story of Nanook of the North is that, you know, <clears throat> when you follow that through line of the full story, there was a lot of harm caused there. And I think that film, if you think about it, also was at the intersection of capitalism and art and film because, you know, Flaherty, he he messed up, right? Like he he screwed up his 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 reels and he had to go back because he was being commissioned. So there and, and then you look at who was commissioning him. So there's layers that I think people don't really unpack about Nanook, which are really informative when we start thinking about seeing that through line till today. And you look at even the exploitative nature of the large streamers that are now sort of you know rampant in the field, which are causing us as makers, even specifically BIPOC filmmakers, documentary filmmakers who are looking for opportunities to shift and kind of like swerve in ways that we don't want to. And then I think of even, you know, I know Sri Devi, we were part of some conversations that getting real about public television, you know, this this is a public space. This is supposed to be, you know, our stories, our communities. And more so than than not, you see those entities being more and more um, replicative of corporate structures. And I think for us as filmmakers and artists, I think part of our work and our challenge is to fight and push back against those kind of practices that we see and that we witness at the same time as we have to continue to engage in the struggle of building new structures and have to be aspirational and have to think many generations ahead of us, you know? And I think that's really where I think sometimes it's really challenging because our field is is a field that really, to me, thrives on scarcity and makes us feel like there's not enough and we all have to fight and struggle. But there is an abundance of money. I mean, you look at what's happened during the pandemic and billionaires are are, are, are making tons of profits. And you look at these streamers that are all these deals that are getting signed. And I think it's important for us to not fall into a trap where we feel like, oh, I have to fight the person next to me who looks like me. And that's, well, I'm telling that story, that immigrant story or that undocumented story. No, there's space for hundreds of those stories because we're still playing catch up. I mean, you know, we just started getting cameras in our hands about 50 years ago. And then really, I feel like right now we're in the beginning of a, this really incredible wave of, you know, filmmakers of color having not only just the tools of production accessible, but I think the actual, like structures of production. So we now own production companies, we own studios, we have networks like ADOCs, we have film festivals like this. So we are starting to see a foundational shift that I think is really exciting. And I think part of it as someone who is, you know, I'm 46 and you know, I, I got a late start as far as like actually getting a film that had backing and feeling like, okay, I can be a filmmaker. I've always been a, a, a teacher. It's been a passion of mine. So it's not something that was like a fallback. It was what I started doing as something I really wanted to do, which was teach. And then as I became interested in film, I was like, oh, there's no way I can do this for a living. Like, it's just not possible, it's too hard. But now as I, you know, mentor young filmmakers, I want them to have the aspirational, you know, um, vision that they can be filmmakers, that storytelling is an, is an actual, like incredibly important tool of culture. And, you know, we're talking about reclaiming histories and retelling, you know, stories that, you know, think about how many of us know people in our own families and our own communities that have no idea about our history because that's been stolen, right? It's been taken away from us and it's been hidden from us. And I love, you know, discovering some of those histories through the films that, that we are making, you know? So I just have to say that I think it's like, these are great conversations. I'm so excited that so many of them are happening right now because I think that, you know, we are really, you know, just beginning to see this wave where, you know, we are reclaiming things that that we didn't have, they weren't meant for us. You know what I mean? These things were not meant for us. Um, and I think that there's like an infinite amount of stories out there to be told, you know, so it's a very exciting time, as well as a time for us to really notice how we move through space and how we build a lot of um, connectivity in our work. Because so many of us are doing incredible work and we're very busy people. But like, if we can start coming together on some of these initiatives and ideas, I mean, you know, we have everything we need within our communities. It's about really getting that, you know, access to those, you know, points of, 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 of you know, capital and being able to build things and be able to get the, you know, the funding and the other resources we need. Thank you for that. And, and something that um, really resonated with me, I think that what all of you are saying is, what are the belief mm -hmm. systems, right? That we have been taught and we have been conditioned to believe, you know, the conversation about abundance, you know, and scarcity. 
you know, if, if, if I get it, you don't get it, or someone's already doing that story, so you can't do that story. So with all of that, like going, all right, we're just not gonna accept your belief systems, <laughs> forget it. We, we don't accept them, we don't agree with them. So if we move into this new structure, right, this new model, um, the, as Rahi said, reconstruction, like what does the value system look like? I'm curious from each of you, what are the values that should build this new structure and system or, or and are already kind of, you, you all are part of building them. Would love to hear kind of what, what drops in for you around that. Anyone jumping? I can share, I can share a little bit. Um, also, I mean, I feel like this right now is part of the reconstruction, right? Um, I can't stop smiling when Emily and Bobbin are talking. Every time the last few conversations that I can remember I had with Emily, I had with Bobbin were about reconstructing. You know, it's a, about, I remember one of the first conversations I, I had with Bowen where he was kind of expressing his frustration of like, we're just tired of doing like educating um, about how colonized um, documentary is. And like, you know, we all know that. We, we know that now what? We got to organize, we got to do the work, we got to create, we got to create this foundation, like this foundation and the platform and the structures that we need for ourselves. And we can, only we can do that, right? So that was a very regenerative conversations. And one of the ways is for us to figure out how can we be in spaces together, right? How can we like more and more space? So that's, that's for me is the foundation um, where we build on what we need, right? Um, I, I wanna uh, bring in something that always makes me smile so much, a passage I was reading by Asada Shakur. Um, so I'm gonna read just a couple of sentences from there. This is the 21st century and we need to redefine revolution. But I think that the way she spells it is re-evolution. It's not just, it's not enough just to change the system. We need to change ourselves. Revolution is creative. Revolution means protecting the people. And I hold that so much with me um, in my art practice or in my documentary work. And I think when we talk about reconstructing, I uh, really lean to this value of, um, of this like you know it's not enough to change the system we need to change ourselves and piggybacking piggybacking on what emily was um saying about we have so much internalized colonial behaviors and white supremacy and all of that right so i think for me one of the like first steps is um to figure out how to unlearn those right and and again, like I feel like because I'm I, I'm grateful, Sri Devi, that you kind of framed the panel in the beginning that we're not talking about like I'm what I'm sharing right now. It is the reconstruction, right? So we have already acknowledged documentaries, uh, colonial, and all of that, right? So starting from here, let's say for instance on Documented Filmmakers Collective, right? Um, we're pretty much uh, mostly BIPOC folks. Um, we came in with shared identity, shared experiences. Um, and now it's time for us to um, unlearn a lot of things together, right? To be able to tell stories that are not harmful and that are ethical. So some of the values that like we kind of echoed each other in, the, in our some of our initial meetings were that recognizing so a lot of our shared experiences brought us to some shared values like recognizing that uh, we are in a field that's so competitive right that is um we're all going for the same fellowship we're all applying for the same fund right so initially at that point it was like 30 members in our collective so for the 30 of us we're trying to build a new world we're trying to build a new you know, family. Um, so how, like one of the first values is that elevation, not competition, and having a strong belief that we can rise together. Foundationally, like believing in that and centering that it is possible to rise together, right? Um, one of the other values is like, again, echoing what Balvin was saying about uh, operating from scarcity. So that is a learned behavior within us that white supremacy has instilled in us to operate from scarcity. How do we break out of that? So I think one of the things for us is 
believing that we have enough, we are enough, right? Um, our collective there, even till now, um, we were supposed to have our in-person uh, retreat at, at Tribeca, but Tribeca got canceled because of pandemic. So we never had an in-person uh, retreat and our collective has you know, existed for two years now. Um, and a lot of times when we were talking about community building, we were talking about coming in person together, going out for drinks, um, meeting up for dinners. But I think like Undocumented Filmmakers Collective is like a solid community and we built it all online. So it is possible, like imagining that impossible is possible. And I think that was something that um, we center and we believe in and we operate from um, this deep um, uh, sense of like abundance, you know, uh, and deep sense of hope. And um, also, um, I totally forgot my train of thought, but I think I'll pass it to someone else. But yeah, I guess to just to wrap it up that, you know, also another uh, quick thing is, what are we centering as we're building community, as we are building this, rest restructuring this field, right? What are the pillars collectively in the BIPOC storytelling? What are the pillars that we collectively want to um, sort of, um, uh, what's the word? Like dig in in into um, into the ground, right? That will um, that we will be standing in the shoulders of these pillars or something. Is centering wellness and care, right? I think capitalism completely um, brainwashes us in a place that our understanding of what joy, our understanding of what care is, is. Like we, we feel completely satisfied with working 40 hours and having like three weeks vacation in a year, right? Um, so in our collective, um, we are, you know, restructuring our pay structure, right? 20, 40 hours is not the work time. At 30 hours, let's say is full time. And within that, um, our mental health care is incorporated, right? Our healing circles that we have collectively is incorporated as our work time. Um, and so, yeah, so restructuring looks in so many different ways and there's so much to talk about. Um, and one other thought is that um, I always uh, quote Raquel Willis, uh, who spoke in the opening ceremony of Allied Media Conference and said that if you want to decolonize documentary, you need to decentralize leadership. And that is something that we're practicing in our collective, because um, a lot of a lot of ideologies, a lot of values um, exist, and we're so blessed to inherit so much from Black feminist theories, from abol abolitionist theories that have already been um, so much wisdom that has been left for us. Right. The only way it becomes reality is by practicing it, and it is. I think that's where the struggle is. Is that. Um, you know, even like in Undocu Filmmakers Collective, we are able to practice, learn, like unlearn, learn together, experiment and practice, right? So our collective is completely operates, completely decentralized. Um, and, you know, we have like radical, transparent communication about everything with everyone. Um, and as we are practicing that, we're realizing what What's coming up? What's showing up? Like, how is white supremacy showing up in our work? How is colonial behavior showing up as we're practicing that? And that learning process is going to be long, right? It's not going to be like within a week, we're going to just um, unlearn everything. So, but if we don't practice, we don't, we can't really know what we need to unlearn and how we need to unlearn. Mm, so appreciate that. I want to jump over to Emily or Bowen and say, if you guys have anything you'd like to add into this, conversation about value with Emily? Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's not a coincidence that Rahi, Bowen, and myself are, are all, like none of us are doing this alone, right? And I don't think you really can do much alone, sort of, you know, in some ways, because there are parts of the filmmaking process that are quite solitary, um, but also, you know, if as filmmakers, um, you know, and as organizers, we are trying to uh, sort of pull apart, dismantle a really colonial system of filmmaking 
while at the same time creating alternatives, which I think, you know, we need to be doing both of those things at the same time. That's not something we can do alone, right? Um, and I think, you know, Rahi, like some of the things that you mentioned around sort of like decentralizing leadership, right? Be and, and centering care, like all of these are, I think to me, like conscious ways of, um, I don't think it's a coincidence, right? That they're like conscious ways of countering uh, colonialism, but also of capitalist ways of thinking. And I think those are things that um, need to be done in ways that address the sort of existing hierarchies um, that, you know, we're inside of, right? Like we're, we're not, none of us are, outside of capitalism or patriarchy or all these forces, right? Um, I think, I think um, you know, so, I, you know, I'm also involved in a couple of different like groups that help me stay accountable, honestly, I think, and, and to help me reflect on, you know, it's not just Robert, it's not just Flaherty who made mistakes, right? Like I've definitely, like the films that I've made, I reflect back and I think uh, of like, you know, why didn't we talk about money, right? Like my first film, like I, I really, really regret that. Like, why didn't we talk about money at all? Like I didn't plan to ever make money with it and I, I didn't really, but we should have talked about that, right? Like we should talk about money, we should have talked about credits, um, that kind of thing. And I think, you know, having collective spaces can help you learn like from those mistakes. Um, I think I want to also kind of even as we're sort of building these alternatives to capitalism um, within the filmmaking spheres, I think it's critical for us to also recognize that there is a fundamental tension between right, the kind of non-capitalist ways of working, which can be in collectives, um, but also in the process of making a film, right? Like often when we start making documentaries, uh, pretty much until the end, like that, you know, maybe we get some money, but often we're working right within you know, a non-capitalist system, which is is based on friendship, it's based on solidarity, it's based on these kinds of relations of exchange, right? You know, and this is this might be boring, but anthropologists have have done a lot of research on this, right? This idea of the um, in non-capitalist systems, right? What is what? How do these relations of exchange of non-capitalist exchange work? Um, but I think you know, I would say we can learn from that, but also the reality that we live in is actually that we, that, that within the, in, in the filmmaking practice, you know, in my experience is that those things exist in tension and in, in simultaneity with the capitalist um, system in part because films as, as sort of these relations, right? These, these relationships that we have with the people that we're making films with, um, these kind of cohere eventually into an actual thing, right? Into an object, right? That, you know, in a capitalist system, that object is considered alienated from those relationships, right? And that object can then be sold, right, to a Netflix or to, right, an Amazon, God forbid, right, an Amazon. <laughs> and so I think, I think, I think one of the, the things that we really need to think about is like, even if our films don't make money, right, as directors, as producers, there are benefits that we get from that in ways that sometimes the communities that we're working with you know, that might be collaborative in the beginning, but then what happens later? So I think there's that tension there that um, we need to really think through. Um, I think one other thing I would say in terms of thinking about, um, you know, different value systems and thinking about alternatives is also um, questioning, you know, Western norms of authorship and of artistic autonomy. Um, I think, you know, uh, even this idea that you can kind of separate an object from the relations that created it, that is Western notion, right? We need to kind of provincialize that. Um, and I think this idea that, you know, the, the kind of idea of autonomy that I grew up with, right, is not one in which I act in my own interests and forget about everyone else, right? Like in the Korean community, we talk, you know, we're brought up with this idea of nunchi, right? The idea that you have um, awareness of the people around you. And yes, sometimes it can be toxic in terms of class relations, but like, yes, you have awareness of people around you and you act sort of according to those things. And so, um, you know, in, in, in my own reflection upon my filmmaking work, I'm really interested in how can we challenge um, these, this narrow notion of Western autonomy and how can we instead actually center this 
um, relational autonomy. Um, and that might be through, you know, collectives, cooperatives, but also in the filmmaking process. What are times when we ourselves as directors and producers step back actually, and to allow the people that, um, you know, are participants in our films to contribute, put on the director's hat, um, maybe take a credit, you know, um, depending on their role and contribute creatively. And that collaborative process, I think itself can shape the filmic, can shape filmic form in a way that is not only more ethical, but also, I think, can make a more powerful film, a more beautiful film um, in ways that will really resonate. Mm, thank you so much. I, I have some thoughts about that. Before we do that, I want to get to Bowen, and then we have a couple of questions from the audience. And so, um, Bowen, your thoughts. Um, first off, yeah, you guys said so much there. That was amazing. And I, I feel like I, I had some like notes pre the, the conversation. And so like you guys are totally hitting on all, all of some, some of the things that we, we talked about. And I want, I want to just say one thing that I, I really feel is something that helps to, um, to reshape um, what the work that we're doing is mentorship. And I think one of the things about, I think all film and maybe all art forms is because they're not, there's not like a, a process or like a certification or a degree process that you like, you know, like anybody can be an artist, you know, that's, that's, that's a very like kind of intrinsic natural part of being a human being is being able to express ourselves. So I think mentorship is something that I have really benefited from myself and I am continually, you know, offering. And I think it's one way to also, um, you know, sort of push back against, uh, you know, everything having to have, you know, an assigned monetary value, because I think mentorship is something that can be a little bit here, a little bit there, or something very intensive that's like a, a year long process, or you, you know, have a producer that's mentoring you. Um, and that's been, you know, that's been my part of my process of getting into this particular field. And I think that, you know, one of the things that I really feel strongly about is, is allowing people to make mistakes. And you touched on that, Emily, and like, you, you know, I feel the same way. It's like, I've definitely made mistakes in, in work that I've done or films and, and constantly learning from it, but not assuming that like all of, we're not all perfect. We're going to make mistakes. And I think it's understanding what the impact of those mistakes are and the ways that we can kind of um, find redress in certain situations when we need to, but also just to like continue to like challenge ourselves and deepen our practice and be able to be open to critique. You know, I say one of the things that keeps me um, on my game as a filmmaker is that I'm surrounded by a lot of young people who have no problem because that is encouraged in our spaces to speak up and to say something doesn't feel right and to pause on something or to say, we don't, we need to stop and take a break, you know, or we're actually not going to shoot today because people don't feel well or something's off, you know? And I think like, there's a really huge, you know, aspect of, of, I think the grind that we're all a part of that there, people, oh, well, there's no time for that. There's no space for that. But I think that's where, again, building new structures and you, you touched on this so well, Rahi, you know, wellness and, and mental health and, you know, caring for each other is super important because these are very sort of emotional practices that we're a part of too. It's like, we're dealing with people's lives and sometimes those stories involve trauma and things like that. And I've learned, you know, from, from mentors like, like, Sam Pollard and Tracy Rector and, and you know, peer mentors like Lyric Cabral around ideas of how you build that into your productions and that you think about it ahead of time. If I'm uncovering a story of trauma that, you know, like I, I really, you know, think about how that feeds into my production budget or my team and things like that. So I think these are practices that I think, you know, I, I, I'm shocked that some of these things don't exist and there isn't a deeper, you know, sort of like, conversation around some of these things because you know we are dealing with an art form that creates a level of permanence like i always think about that i'm like you know if i make something and it's up somewhere wherever it may be maybe it's on youtube maybe it's on my instagram story and i think some of those things like someone can grab that image and it can be permanent it can be it can live somewhere else it's not it doesn't belong to me essentially once it goes out but as the artist like i have a responsibility to that image um and i also want to just point out one thing that i think is is decentering the united states period you know the united states is not the center of the world you know and i think it's important for us to understand global perspectives you know honestly right now i've been telling a lot of filmmaker a lot of friends i'm like the best cinema that to me that's happening right now in the world is in africa on the african continent east african films west african films south african films i mean there's incredible work coming out there but as a marketplace in the united states you rarely see that you will have something breakthrough every once in a while but 
I think it's important for us to do that work and to not assume that what we see here is what is what the world is sort of thinking or doing in a particular moment or art form because you know there's incredible opportunities that I think as they sort of open up in other countries you see this incredible you know, because there's artists that have been waiting for this stuff you know I, we we at next Doc, we do have an international connection to filmmakers in West Africa, East Africa and also on in India and and you know one of the things that I'm starting to notice is how many people are really playing with the form even and kind of just like deconstructing the way that stories are told. And it's really an exciting time for that. And those folks need support and mentorship. You know, that's the one thing we hear a lot is in emerging, you know, countries where the form is emerging and the marketplace is sort of like rushing to be like, who are the, you know, let's anoint this filmmaker from this country, the filmmaker from India, the filmmaker from, you know, this region. And it's like, no, there's hundreds of them. And I think it's like, how do we put resources towards those, you know, filmmakers? And then the last thing I'll just say is that I think we need to move away from this idea of legacy filmmakers and like branded filmmakers. So like, you know, there's been a lot of conversations around Ken Burns, you know, and, and you know, Grace Lee, shout out to Grace, you know, another one of my you know mentors who I feel really someone that, you know, is willing to share and, and is so, you know, sort of like, you know, gracious with time and just thoughts. And she wrote this incredible piece in this Ford Foundation, you know, 40 creatives, you know, you can find it online about Ken Burns. And I think it's, you know, we've accepted so many things to just be like, oh, Ken Burns documentary, it's a Ken Burns, you know, what do they call it? The Ken Burns effect and all these things. And like, but at the same time, like what opportunities are being take away, like, taken away when we only fund legacy filmmakers like Ken Burns or Steve James, you know? And I think of, you know, a lot of other filmmakers who have had as prolific careers in production and the work that they've produced that we don't know, that we don't see their work as uplifted and amplified. Um, by these different, you know, networks or, or or platforms like PBS. So, you know, I think it's important for us to really think about how we even fall into that as filmmakers, you know, and I think, you know, how we sort of like spread ourselves and our knowledge and our wealth is super important. So I'm I'm really big on mentorship and sharing and trying to sort of like demonetize that when you can. I mean, obviously people do have to, you know, sort of earn a living and I want to, I say all that, you know, sort of anti-capitalist, you know, conversations some people you know sometimes i think it's important for us to remind there are people that need those opportunities and need to get paid and all that you know need to take those opportunities for those big streaming you know uh, deals and things like that but the point is how do you take that deal and how do you actually while you're there at the table negotiating that maybe just add one new thing that they haven't thought about bring in one thought process you know advocate for example i tell people i, I learned this from tracy rector who's an indigenous uh, first nations filmmaker based in seattle area Tracy said, you know, introduce con con the concept of a cultural consultant. And that's a paid position when you go into a, a community, you're working in a community that you're not a primary person from that community. You, Someone is paid to, you know, help you understand that in a way that isn't just like coming to extract, but building a relationship, you know? And I think that, I think it's important for us to think about the ways that we can reshape the field because these are things that I never heard about, you know, as I was being, you know, sort of uh, trained or learning as a filmmaker. So. I think there's a lot of things that, and then Larry Cabral brings um, social workers and uh, onto the set, you know, as she's doing interviews so that she makes sure that if people need that added level of care, someone to talk to after the interview that unearths this thing that they didn't expect, there's someone on set while they're, you know, doing the interviews to talk to them. So I think there's a lot of really new ideas that are out there and it's, it's really exciting to, to, to be part of this conversation because I feel like I'm like taking some notes from you guys too. It's like, we're all learning from each other. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, so we're going to get to some audience questions in just a minute, because believe it or not, wow. we only have 10 minutes left. Okay. And I know we want to respond to our audience. But one thing I just wanted to say about this conversation about decentralization and decentering, um, you know, uh, Rahi and I were talking about the other day about the idea, or maybe it was actually Emily, you and I were talking about the idea of the average audience, you know, the average viewer. And it's this idea when we can talk about the Ken Burns, and we talk about it from a capitalistic standpoint, you know, Ken Burns, that name is going to bring in money. And so that's where that energy is put in. You're going to get sponsorship stations. You're going to do everything. And then when you want to bring in a different story, the conversation is, well, would the average audience like that? Would the average viewer like that? And first of all, the frustration with the comment like that is, well, who do you mean when you say average audience, average viewer? In public media, that means older white people, just frankly, and older affluent white people, let's be very clear. Um, and then secondarily, it's, but we've created the structure. We built up the Ken Burns in that world. We gave him the marketing and the energy and all of that space and resources. And so if we come up, how, wh why, what, to your point, to everyone's point, 
you know, we're creating a self-fulfilling prophecy <laughs> that we're just like feeding into instead of saying, no, let's challenge ourselves to actually say other audiences would like other things. The same audiences would like other things. Let's not just assume that, that only certain people will only watch certain things, right? I mean, I think that's, again, it's going to these belief systems that are, I think, really, really difficult to get past. But when you are given the space and you have people and institutions who are willing to go with it, which is the other thing I want to say before we go to audiences, I've been talking with a lot of people about this conversation in our current institutions, what needs to happen, you know, education, we get back to the education. And I think I've come to the place that say people just need to leave and new people need to get hired. I mean, that's the truth, because I, I, if you haven't already done the work to get there, I don't know how much more I'm going to tell you to get there. And I think that's the hard thing, but it is the truth. In my in my experience, I will say that. And with that, <laughs> I'm going to go to a question that one of our audience members has about um, the authentic voice. And essentially the question is, is like, you were talking here about that authentic voice, people who are able to tell their own stories where do you go? And I would add in, how do you know? What are the what are the questions you should be asking yourself? Here I am watching a film. What what is the research and homework I need to do? So anyone want to jump in on that one? I don't know if I can fully answer the question, but can I? I want to share something. Um, and if we didn't go into question, that's something. That's one of the points that I was going to share. Um, that. Again, going back to just a little bit into the reconstructing process is that, um, and this is, I, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm saying this to specific audience, uh, folks whose stories have been told, uh, have been stolen for centuries and uh, folks who are marginalized and uh, didn't have platform to share their stories. Um, this is like the way to move forward for me um, in terms of reconstructing uh, storytelling is finding our aesthetic and not letting go of our ancestors aesthetic, our cultural aesthetic, right? And not giving into um, the, you know, uh, yeah, like the aesthetics that's demanded from the gatekeepers right now, right? Um, that's I, I feel like that's a whole nother question as to like how can that practically um, happen because we're all going for Sundance, we're all going for you know like the Oscars, and that's that's another another conversation. But coming back to the question that was asked, is um, I can say that um, follow on Documented Filmmakers Collective, <laughs> and um, you know I. One of uh, two people I would like to mention, um, give a shout out to Miko Rivereza, who was one of the founding members of the Undocumented Filmmakers Collective, is completely uh, in like one of my, uh, someone I lo look up to um, in terms of someone who's experimenting with style, experimenting with aesthetic and new ways of telling stories. And um, and then also said Hernandez Ronquillo is, um, you know, has, spoken a lot about undocumented aesthetic. What does that look like? Um, and so, yeah, if you follow our collective, I think one of the things that we're really trying to uplift is that, um, you know, undocumented stories have been told for decades. We didn't have the platform to, um, or like distribution platforms to share those stories, but those stories have been told and have existed. Stories that were told by our communities for our communities, um, and they exist. Um, so if you're a follower collective, we're always uplifting those authentic stories from coming from undocumented uh, communities. Great, and I would offer a couple of organizations out there. I know I'm gonna miss some, so people jump in, but there's. Brown Girls Doc Mafia, there is ADOCS, the Asian American Documentary Network, there is the Black Documentary Collective. There no, I know there are others, but um, definitely jump jump in and say, it's like, learn who those groups are, learn who those makers are, you know, follow their work, follow them on Facebook, follow them on Twitter, see what they're posting. See what are, I will tell you this, like I started joining the collectives that were appropriate to me a year or two ago. And the number of things I have read in the last couple of years, just from either their own thoughts or articles they've written, articles they posted has been huge. And I really appreciate it so much of just going out and following the people who seem like really interesting and out there and what they're doing. All right, we're gonna go to the next question. Um, it's a question about this idea of consent. And um, 
the question you can see pop up here is how do you feel about consent when you are telling stories about with people people with power who do harm. So I'd kind of rephrase that as, is what does consent look like in that situation? Or how do you, how would you even approach the framing of that question, I guess? Emily or Bowen, do you want to take that? Um, I, I mean, I think there's like a lot of different nuances within that question, because I think that one of the things that I always talk about is like the minute you pick up a camera, right? You, there's a power shift, a power dynamic has shifted. And I think furthermore in documentary, <clears throat> I do think there's a, a number of different iterations of documentary styles and types of stories and what you're trying to sort of, you know, um, the impact you're trying to have with your films. And I do think that it's really about the power differential. And I think in most cases, you know, I do think, you know, there's obviously films that are extremely valuable, important, investigative, Films uncovering, you know, speaking um, truth to power and, and systems and political, you know, um, regimes that are super important, you know. And I think obviously you're not going to ask a dictator for their consent to do an investigative documentary about them. But I think that you know when we talk about consent, we're talking about the inherent power dynamic that a filmmaker has when they come into um, a situation, a community, um, with a camera and and are asking people to do this or like, I'm going to be filming or or to you know even the, even my, my my sort of like. I cringe when I hear the term fly on the wall because I think that that's, that's really a way to sort of obscure the responsibility of a filmmaker. And I think that it's important for us to recognize um, the, the power dynamic that happens as soon as we step into a situation. There's, there's literally, it's, it's like almost impossible to even change just the sort of like energy in a space when a camera's in there and people are pointing at it. Even in today's age, well, everyone's got a camera. Well, that's different than you're making a film, you know? So, so I think that there is a, um, a power shift and a power dynamic that you have to assess. And I think that that question, you know, I mean, I think, it, you know, I'm working also in this group um, doing values, ethics and accountability with some incredible people like Sonia Childress and Natalie Bullock Brown and Molly Murphy from, um, from Story Shift and Working Films. And one of the things we talk about is the differentiation between storytelling that is about exposing power and kind of like speaking truth to power and filmmaking that is about a community and telling a more kind of like, you know, um, a story that's more personal, you know, um, or maybe following somebody's journey or path. And I think that there's a, there's a lot of nuance within that. And I think it's this work that we're trying to do is to unpack the different ways that people can be more ethical and more accountable to their, their filmmaking um, practice so that there is a way that we build in these levels of values in our work, you know, because again, it's like we've said this a couple of times, it's super important to realize that these films have an impact and one of the impacts has been for, 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 for films has to harm people and to cause harm. And we know of documentaries that have caused people to like go into hiding because they didn't know the film was gonna be released in a certain, you know, region or country. And so it's important as filmmakers that have had to be anonymous, you know, so I think it's important for us to think, to think about the power we have as we tell our stories um, and then go forward and think about where where is the need for consent? Where is the need for me to actually, you know, not ask for consent because I'm exposing something that is really important for people to know more about. Thank you so much. I think that there was so much that you said there and I feel like we could have a whole conversation just about the yeah. consent ethics and things. Oh, yeah. And just, I think just to reflect back what, you know, what I what really resonated is like, what is the type of story you're telling? And then based on the story, based on you know what what you're going for, who is involved, and how that story, you know, there's mm -hmm. so many of those elements. That's that's the difficulty of trying to do I something know, like this in sixty right. minutes, right? We're gonna touch on all of them. And we have one more question, and then I think after that question, we're gonna have to wrap it up. So we'll do this last question. Um, so speaking of capitalism, how can we ascribe values to films that aren't based on the box office? Mm. Who wants to take that? I guess I could take a stab at that. Um, I think, I mean, I think it's a great question and I think you're asking it in the right place. I mean, I think the Philly Asian American Film Festival, um, following these kind of community-based film festivals is really critical because, you know, I won't name names, but I would say that, you know, I think Philly, uh, you know, PATH, you know, the Latino, uh, Latino Film Festival in Philly, like these are, fest these are the types of festivals that I think are very conscious about how they curate films and thinking about not, you know, who's, who, who are the screenwriters, right? Who are the directors and producers? I think that's one piece. I also think that, you know, some of the same 
uh, you know, we can think about value in terms of profit, but we can all, value has these multiple dimensions mm. of meaning, right? So value in terms of what are the values that we bring to the table and that are important to you as, as someone who, um, you know, is a consumer of films or is a spectator of films. And I think, you know, um, for me personally, some of the values that I've learned as an organizer from like movement based, um, uh, activism, I think can be applied actually to films. Um, and so the same uh, values of solidarity, of accountability, of agency and autonomy, right? So these things um, actually are, you know, the more we can learn about how a film is created and whether it has used some of those practices that we've talked about in this panel today, I think are really important. And part of that is, as Sri Davy pointed to, um, really following the work of, um, of makers, whether it's, you know, Undocumented Filmmakers Collective, whether it's Asian American Documentary Network, Brown Girls Doc Mafia, you know, some of the smaller collectives as well, like Reason, Ethnocene are two that I'm involved with. Um, you know, I think a lot of the makers that are coming out of Bowen's pro program are, are USFX are really incredible. So I think following, you know, these smaller outfits actually, and these community-based organizations and festivals is really the place to get to know um, individual makers and communities that are building these alternative systems. Yeah, uh, thank you so much. And I would just add, since we, this is the Philadelphia Asian American Film Festival, two organizations that are doing incredible work that are community-based, Scribe Video Center, and of course, Philly Cam. Mm -hmm. So get to know about both of them. All right, that's it for us. I want to give each of you like 60 seconds, ridiculous amount of time, right? Um, just any parting thoughts, <laughs> anything you want to share. Um, we'll start with Emily, let's come back to you. Um, I feel like I think we are frozen slightly. So Emily, let's come back to you and hopefully your connection will um, get better. Rahi, you look like your connection is solid. So let's go to you. Um, I think the last thing that comes to mind is, you know, as we were talking about reconstruction, so I'm kind of imagining this like new space, right? New culture, new, um, um, the, uh, a space that feels safe for uh, folks that don't feel safe in this world, right? Um, and I think one of the byproducts of um, colonialism was that um, for BIPOC folks to break, like our chains were broken in so many ways, right? We were um, um, kind of like uh, lost our lands, lost our people, lost our families, things like that. So as we are going, moving into this, um, you know, uh, new imagination, um, how just to hold this that we need to take care of each other. We need to uh, come into spaces with unconditional love, which we, Divi and I, uh, from our conversation, I wanted to, I wanted to bring that to the space that we come into a space with unconditional love for each other. And, and just remember again, that um, I wanted to read, it is our duty to fight for our freedom and we have nothing to lose but our chains. So how do we hold that as we are moving into this new imagina imagination? Thank you, thank you so much, Emily. Yeah, I think my connection is, is back now. Um, you know, I'm just grateful to have been a part of this conversation. I think festival conversations are really critical, but it's also just like kind of scratching the surface in some ways in terms of what we can talk about. So I think continuing to really, um, uh, going back to something that Bowen said about mentorship, right? Like maybe mm -hmm. you don't have a guru mentor, but actually what you, what you have is, you know, you've been to this panel, maybe you've met some people through the festival. I think also going to your peers and really thinking about, okay, I wanna make a film, but I don't know how to do it. Or, you know, I'm interested in this this small piece, but I don't know how to do it. So just ask someone who um, has maybe done the kind of thing that, you know, like I just uh, sort of helped start a residency and I went to Rahi, cause it was like, oh, Rahi, you're, you're, you've already like started this residency thing. How can you, um, how can we think about doing a residency that challenges these conventional models? So I think 
not being afraid to draw on community. And for me, um, Asian American Documentary Network has just been an incredible space where mm -hmm. I can ask those questions. So if you are an Asian American um, filmmaker, um, I really encourage you to, to check out our network and join. Great, thank you, Emily Ballin. Yeah, um, I mean, first off, just want to shout out the festival um, and, uh, you know, I just feel like there's something about Philadelphia. Uh, you got incredible, you know, festivals. Uh, Black Star is another incredible uh, festival organization. And Philly is, you know, I mean, now will forever be known as the city that put us over the top and got rid of Donald Trump. Um, so, you know, a lot happened in Philly. You guys have a lot to be proud of. Um, but I just want to say, I think part of it for me is I really want to, you know, sort of use a phrase that Chi Wei Yang um, uh, coined a few years ago, getting real, when he said this idea of recentering and like, where are the new centers of gravity, you know? And I think like, that is what we are in the in, in, in process of right now. And to know that there's a, ones that have existed, you know, Third World Newsreel, you know, JP uh, Tanaki and, and Roselli Torres and, you know, Rene Tajima Pena, there's, there are folks who have been doing this work and I think we're building on their sort of like, you know, um, hard work and struggle early on in the, in the 60s and 70s, really like the first wave of, um, of you know, BIPOC filmmakers who got cameras and started saying, you know, fuck this, we're not gonna just follow the norms, we're gonna do something different. Um, and I, want, I saw some people asking questions about like, how can I learn more? One book that I have to recommend is Pooja Rangan's book, Immediations, which is um, through Duke Press, um, I think it's the best place to get it. But I just have to say that film is all about like us coming back to realizing that these films are not about giving voice to people and accepting our, our responsibility as filmmakers. And then I think that, can really align us around a new paradigm and a new aesthetic and a new way of thinking about the film. And I wanna just say that I'm so excited right now because I think that there's a moment here where we have built some incredibly powerful institutions, ADOC, BGDM, NextDoc, Undocumented Filmmakers Collective. And now the challenge I think for us is how do we align? How do we come together? How do we interconnect and build a base and a foundation that we're gonna look back and generations that are gonna come after us are not gonna to have to do all that struggle and work, but they're gonna come into this realm and they're going to be able to create and they're going to be able to make you know incredible work um, and incredible films thank you so much so to, to echo everyone thank you philadelphia asian american film festival thank you everybody who has been part of this conversation thank you selena thank you emily bowen and rahi um i hope you all wherever you are have a good rest of your morning day or evening and please please take good care of yourself good night or good morning or good afternoon. <laughs> Bye Thank everyone. You. you say this kill black and brown and when will you talk about class in this story? The rest is allegory. Come to protection to what we gonna do organize our way through and for those behind bars we must fight hard global pandemic endemic systemic no equality no quality of life of life